Hello and welcome to EB5 Investment Report. I'm your host, Amy Rios, and today we conclude our series on the EB5 process, pitfalls, and problems. In this edition, we will discuss the I-829 and look into why some projects fail. The 829 is the final petition for entrepreneurs to remove conditions on their permanent resident status and must be filed within 90 days prior to the two-year anniversary of the I-485 approval. Failure to file this in a timely manner may result in denial of conditional resident status and initiate removal proceedings. It is at this stage that investors must demonstrate that the business plan they outlined in their I-526 is in motion. They must show that a new commercial enterprise has been established, that the foreigner is invested or in the process of investing, that the investment and commercial enterprise have been sustained throughout the two-year conditional residence period, and that the investment created or is expected to create at least 10 permanent full-time jobs. And this is where many investors run into trouble if they lack the proper professional guidance. Job creation methodology is probably the most important and complicated aspect of the EB-5 process. Currently, USCIS is being sued by a group of investors who are now facing deportation because of tenant occupancy issues. We spoke with Steve Annapol, corporate and securities attorney, at a recent EB-5 seminar about the issues of job creation and tenant occupancy. Everything is predicated on job creation. If you create the requisite number of jobs, you satisfy the requirements or one of the requirements under the EP-5 program and the investor ultimately gets a permanent green card. So when you look at job creation, if you use a direct model, you're just counting W-2s. If you use an indirect model, you're not looking at the direct workers, you're saying, if I, there's different models, there's redine, there's RIMS, there's impact, there's different economic models. And based on the variables, the input that you use, let's say it's an expenditure model. If I expend a certain amount of dollars in this type of project, through an economic modeling, it will create a theoretical number of jobs. And because these economic models have been accepted by the Immigration Service, economists can basically run a methodology, an economic model, that says if you spend this type of money, or there's certain models that are revenue generating, but if you do certain things, if you put certain input into this model, it's going to spit out a certain number of jobs. So if your modeling is incorrect, or if the variables that you use get discounted or, or discredited, it reduces the number of jobs. So with the lawsuits, if you're not relying on W-2 jobs, you just count up the number of workers, but you're relying on an economic model, you need to make sure that your, your model is sustainable and that there aren't any problems with your model. And the Immigration Service has taken a certain position in the TED and occupancy space, mm -hmm. which just creates a problem with some of the modeling that has occurred. Therefore, it reduces the number of jobs. Therefore, if you're raising money and expecting 10 employees, mm -hmm and you only get eight, that person doesn't satisfy the job creation requirement and they get deported. What are some challenges that you face when dealing with USCIS, for instance? I'm a corporate lawyer, so from the immigration perspective, my partners, my immigration partners, I have Kate Kalmakov, I have Laura Reif, they're very good, and they focus on the immigration-related things. The things that I see with the Immigration Service is a, a fundamental um, misunderstanding or not understanding uh, corporate deal structure. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of structures that are common in the corporate environment that are new to immigration. And so where they, the immigration service may feel that a structure or a provision in a contract is contrary to the permissible rules under the EB-5 program, we have to, as corporate lawyers, explain that their interpretation isn't always accurate and give them evidence or explanations as to why the provisions or the deal structure actually do satisfy the program. So it's really just basic corporate a deal structure and contract provisions. At any point during the petitioning process, USCIS may send a REF, a request for evidence, if they feel an application lacks the proof needed for officers to fully evaluate an application or petition. That's why the words due diligence constantly come up when discussing EB-5, and if investors, developers, and regional centers do not have the guidance of an expert to help them navigate through the process, they will surely fail. 
Brian Sue of Artists and Business Group spoke with us recently about the main reasons projects and regional centers fail and the biggest challenges investors face. I think uh, some of the uh, developers, because of the need of the capital, they rush into the program, rush into the marketplace, and the lack of the basic understanding of the market lack of standing of overseas culture, you know, the international culture, and uh, so they fail. And uh, the important thing is uh, some of the developers, they, they, they lack of the professional guidance in the marketplace. For the most part, projects fail due to lack of understanding the marketplace and not having the guidance of an EB-5 expert. Of course, there are examples of project failures due to fraud and embezzlement, such as MAMTEC International and the El Monte Regional Center, which have tarnished the reputation of the industry. However, if the EB-5 program is properly structured, administered, and regulated, and everyone involved does their due diligence, then the program will do exactly what it was intended to do, create jobs for the United States. I'm Amy Rios, and I want to thank you for watching this edition of EB-5 Investment Report.